sure. Okay. I think we're recording. Yep, we're recording. Sweet. Okay. <laughs> so my name is Dr. Paul Thomas, and I'm joined today by Caitlin Morse. And the impetus for this meeting was uh, I had written a book about direct primary care, and then Caitlin Morse had written an article on LinkedIn about the book and is it really the cure for a broken healthcare system is the question. And there are, there are many more questions. So I think um, just by way of introduction, Caitlin, why don't you tell everybody about yourself? Sure. Yeah. So I've spent the last uh, eight to 10 years navigating the healthcare system with a variety of different insurance models. So we've been self-pay with providers who use insurance. We've used different types of insurance. I'm now a small business owner having to navigate this through the exchange and some of the other options that we have as a small group. And so my journey through that has been long. Um, I've also experienced it as a patient, as a mother. And uh, part of what I'm seeing now as I work in health system strengthening within global health is what pieces of our system are great and we should be exporting to the rest of the world and which pieces of our system are broken and we should try and avoid <laughs> exporting to the rest of the world. Right. And so that got me looking into uh, seeing some of the things that you've been talking about within social media, bought your book, read your book. Thank you. And uh, it was a great, great introduction to the topic. And really, the more I dug into it, the more questions I had, um, right. especially in terms of at the macro level, how do we scale this? How sustainable is this across an entire country? Um, with a background in kind of the business operations side of things went there. Um, I don't have a medical background, but I've been right. working in the kind of health space. And so trying to better understand where this works and where some of its limitations are, I think can kind of help the broader conversation around adoption. So looking forward to talking. Yeah, I think that's a good place to start. Um, why don't we start with that question of scale? I think that's a big one that comes up in people's minds is like, okay, good for you, Paul. You're working in a small community in Southwest Detroit and you have 500 patients, but there's 300 million Americans who could use this sort of service, right? Yeah. And so I think the answer to that is that it will grow. The movement has grown substantially over time. When I started my practice in November of 2016, there were about 400 doctors doing this sort of care model across the country. And now two years later, there's about a thousand physicians wow. practicing in the direct primary care model across the country. And so, you know, if you think there's an average of 500 members per, mm -hmm. you know, doctor mm -hmm. at a thousand doctors, you're looking at 500,000. And there's no reason that this movement should not continue to have linear growth, if not exponential growth, because mm -hmm. it doesn't look like there are any macro level changes. I think we're still suffering through this um, broken health insurance model mm -hmm. um, through which people receive their care. And I think that's a real issue is that people are frustrated with this broken insurance model looking for actual health care services that work for them and their families. Yeah. So can we start with, you mentioned um, one of the things that you talk about in your book is kind of the range of services that people come and talk to you for. Right. And it seems like one of the things that may be a hurdle for some people is the fact that they're so used to the primary care model as it stands today that they don't actually realize the breadth of opportunities that you could see a primary care physician for. Right. So can you kind of give us a range of what are the sort of things where you would say, yep, come to me, I've got you. And what are the sort of things where you'd say, no, you need to go to urgent care or to the ER or to a specialist or kind of what's the range of your services? Sure. I think that's a great question. Um, family, I'm a family medicine doctor. So we say we care for people um, through all ages and stages. So in my career, I've helped deliver babies. I've taken care of neonates. I've worked in a pediatric floor. Um, as like inpatient. So when mm -hmm. your kids are hospitalized, I've worked mm -hmm. with adults in inpatient, outpatient, and also I've helped geriatric populations with house calls and even help people transition, you know, beyond their life to death through like palliative care sorts of mm -hmm. medicine. Mm -hmm. So. Wow. That's quite a range. Yeah. You know, and, and physicians aren't really good at explaining what they do. Right. <laughs> and I think the biggest barrier here is communication. How do we family doctors, internists, pediatricians communicate the value that we provide. Mm -hmm. And then be, beyond just seeing different ages, you know, I'm trained in to care for a range of conditions from coughs and colds to diabetes to, um, you know, high blood pressure, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then I use my hands 
to take care of patients as well. So like I sew up lacerations, I train abscesses, I was trained to do vasectomies, um, et cetera. So there's a lot of procedural things that I would do in my office. I remove moles, I do biopsies, I remove toenails. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you know, we say we can take care of 80 to 90% of your concerns when you come to a family physician. Mm-hmm. And then one cool thing that helps us expand our scope is we start to leverage technology. There's a cool piece of software called Rubicon that I yeah. use. And I use that for specialty consults um, around, let's say you come in with some chest discomfort and I get an EKG that I'm not quite sure about. I can send it over to a cardiologist and get a response more or less within four to 12 hours. Mm -hmm. Um, Similar things for like managing somebody's thyroid problems. You have some funky TSH, T3, T4 readings, and I want a second opinion from an endocrinologist. I can leverage that platform to expand Mm -hmm. my scope. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which not only helps expand your overall experience and skill set for the next time that conversation comes up, uh, right. but also provides that reassurance to the patient right now that <laughs> we yeah. talked to specialists, we're, we're comfortable with where we're going. So. Exactly. Like the um, experience is the greatest teacher, but in the short term, I have that. It's a little bit of a crutch to lean on yeah. a second opinion from a specialist. And, and if you think about it, the traditional alternative would be to have you wait a month mm-hmm. to see that cardiologist or that endocrinologist Mm -hmm. and pay a a higher price point for a service that I could potentially provide in my office. And not only the worry, but also uh, not only the cost, but also the worry and anxiety that people sometimes feel during that wait, right? Of what if it's something (laughs) and, and all of the stress related to that. Right. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. So when you, when uh, my husband and I were talking about this book and one of the first questions he had was, okay, well, what about work-life balance? Like, how do you go on vacation? How do you, (laughs) how do you have a a holiday? How do you do any of these sorts of things? um, If you're kind of a one man band on call all the time, how does that work for your experience? Yeah. I mean, right now I'm by myself, but the plan has always been to grow to a point where I can hire another doctor and bring him or her into our practice and have them, have their own panel of 500 patients. Mm-hmm. Currently, um, you know, I have 500, uh, 420 members, and my goal is to have 500. The typical primary care physician might have 2,400. In fact, that's the average for a family medicine doctor. And so out of that overcrowding for one physician has mm-hmm. come some real problems. You wait a month for an appointment, typical wait time is 24 days for a a scheduled Mm -hmm. appointment with your primary care physician. Mm -hmm. And then you have the symptom of urgent care clinics where in the hour of your greatest need, you're seeing an urgent care provider for, you know, a cough or a cold or a pneumonia or a laceration because Mm -hmm. your doctor simply doesn't have time. So in my model, I've reduced the number of patients that I care for so I can actually care for them and provide all the services to answer your question about taking vacation I email all my patients and I tell them that I'm going on vacation a month before, two weeks before, a week before, a few days before, and the day before. And I say, if you need a refill or something non-urgent, come see me right away and let's take care of it now. Sure. Um, and, and I find that my patients take me up on that offer. And then while I'm away, I check my email every day for about 30 minutes to an hour and make sure I'm not missing anything. Sometimes I will have to call something in and I use Google Voice. But ultimately, I'd like to go on vacation and be completely carefree and have a partner take care of my patients while I'm away. And then I can do that for them when they want to take a vacation. Yeah, no, that's, that's ideal for, for every small business, right? It's to have somebody that <laughs> you can actually right. have a vacation when you're on vacation. Right. No, that, that makes sense. So there could still be situations where your patients may end up at urgent care, but it's a much smaller percentage of the time than a typical primary care. Physician. Right, about you know two, three weeks a year at this point, you yeah. know, my, my wife and I like to travel. So, you know, we did go to Europe in 2018. Nice. We did go to New York. We uh, went up North for a couple of weddings, you know, I'm in Michigan. So going up to Traverse city is beautiful for a wedding in the summer. And so, you know, I'm able to do that. And because my patients have my cell phone, when I'm in the States, they can contact me. And then because I have a Google voice line, when I'm abroad, I can get with them during certain hours when I, when I have Wi-Fi. Yeah. So that's kind of the trade-off. On the one hand, when you're 
out of the office, you're not fully disconnected, but when you're in the office, you're a lot more connected to your patients than you would be. Definitely. And then if you were looking for direct primary care for your family, maybe that's something you'd consider. Maybe you wouldn't want to be a part of my practice because, you know, the other practice down the street has two doctors, right? And then you know that you'd have more or less continuous coverage. So that's something I'm very upfront with my patients about. It's in my contract. There will be a physician absence when I go on vacation. (laughs) Otherwise, my wife would kill me and you wouldn't have a doctor. Yeah, Um, you know, (laughs) there is that. Yeah. So do you see, um, we recently, so we have the experience you're describing of it takes a month or more to get in to see a a primary care physician. Um, And so recently had a situation that ended up being um, barking cough, these sorts of concerns, trouble breathing. And we said, okay, we need to actually see a doctor. And we went to a care clinic in uh, Bartell Drugs. So it's a local CVS, Walgreens kind of equivalent, right? Sure. And we saw a PA. We had a great experience. It Mm -hmm. was $80. We could check in online and we were in and out in 30 minutes. Great. Do you see that as um, helping or hurting the kind of DPC model and what you're trying to do, having more of these kind of pop-up urgent care options? I think having competition in the marketplace is good. You know, I'm, I'm, leaning more towards a free market, you know, libertarian point of view when I approach healthcare, because I want people to have choice. I don't want people to be forced into like a VA sort of situation. And I think the pie is plenty big enough for retail pharmacies and uh, direct primary care providers and um, fee for service docs. I think there's a lot of room in the market for innovative ideas and in my opinion, let the best physicians, providers, services win um, because it's going to give consumers greater options at a lower price point and a better quality of care. So, you know, in my personal opinion, having a DPC doctor that you can text and email and visit whenever you need to is really high value because you also get that continuity of care over time. Whereas, you know, if you see the minute clinic provider, that's fine, but you might see a different person every time who might not have a real grasp on your history mm-hmm. and might not be able to review your past records before giving you a treatment. And it might work really well nine times out of 10, but that one time out of 10, they might give you something that is contraindicated or that they don't know about in your history. So there's yeah. a lot of variables there, but you know, whatever works for you and whatever works for people in the population, you know, it's, it's a good thing to have that competition. Okay. So you feel like having those different options actually helps the overall system be healthier rather than seeing it as a all, all one or not the other. Right. And okay. yeah, the last thing I want to do is mandate everybody to go see a direct primary care doctor. You know, that's not what I'm all about. I want well, that, you that wouldn't have, be success by your definition. Yeah. I want you to have a great experience with your healthcare and, and buy and use the healthcare services that work for you and your family. And if it is through direct primary care service, that's great. Um, if not, you know, many people are satisfied with the fee for service because they might only have to go once a year, but typically once you start going, you know, three, four times a year, you want a better service. You want a better relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that kind of brings me to the question of, you know, this model from a financial standpoint and from Mm -hmm. a overall long-term preventative care standpoint and from all these other, we see all these different types of benefits, right? To both the patient and the payer. If the CMS were to come to you and say, okay, we want to put every Medicaid and every Medicare patient on with a DPC and we want to pay that membership fee. Where do you see some benefits to that approach, some challenges to that approach? Does the fact that patients are opting in change the relationship? Kind of how do you see that scalability from a government funded approach? Yeah, I think as long as the patient is making the choice with a pool of money that they control, and making a choice with their health care. I think it's a win, win, win. Um, because from the government perspective, if you are contracting with a direct primary care physician who has the availability to prevent urgent care or emergency department utilization, you're going to lower the cost that way. From the patient perspective, they get to choose the doctor that they want to work with and have a relationship. And from the doctor's perspective, they get someone who's bought into the idea, to the concept, to the relationship and it can create value all around. Okay. So you wouldn't want a situation where people, you were the only option people had to work with you. You want people to have the, the flexibility and the uh, independence to be able to say, is this the right fit for me and engage in the relationship? 
by choice. Exactly. And I, I see that with a lot of the employer contracts that I work with. So I work with several small businesses locally. Um, you know, I had a small business with 20. I currently have one with 15. And mm -hmm. essentially, <clears throat> they offer it as, as saying, we want to give you some sort of health benefit. However, we're a employer with fewer than 50 employees. So we're not mandated by health insurance. And so it's too expensive for us at this point. So we're going to offer you health care. Who wants in? Then the employees opt in and they cho choose if they want to come and see me. So, you know, I, I find those relationships are really valuable and the people I get to take care of really enjoy using the service and value me as their physician. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Do you, do you see, um, so one of the things you talk about in your book is the crazy levels of inflation <laughs> and right. very high margins that you see on whether it's lab services or medications or various other treatments, right? Where, mm -hmm. hey, this should be three, $3 and it's 300 or this should be 300 and it's 3000 or, you know, not just right. a slight discount, but orders of magnitude different. Mm -hmm. And it, it makes me, having been on the supply chain side of things, it makes me wonder is the fact that you're getting those kind of prices, are you basically paying like what you would for wholesale medication and you're just not getting the margins of a pharmacy or are you actually able to negotiate lower rates? And the reason I ask that is if we were to see 50% of the population move towards a DPC model, mm -hmm. are those pricing options still viable mm -hmm. or would there then be additional overhead costs that would need to be shared among the various DPC providers, for example, distribution of those of the different medications to each of the DPC providers, increasing right. costs, things like that. Right. So I buy my medications at wholesale from the same uh, places that a big box pharmacy might. Okay. So um, we use a company out of Florida and when we buy medications, let's say lisinopril, you might buy a month supply of this blood pressure medication for $10 a month at mm -hmm. CVS or mm -hmm. another big box pharmacy. Um, that that bottle of a thousand pills of lisinopril is about nine dollars and fifty cents or whatever. So when I distribute it out of my office, it's a uh, a cent per pill essentially, or thirty yeah. cents for the one month supply. Yeah. So they buy it at the same price. They just choose to mark it up because they are a retail pharmacy. Mm -hmm. So they make their profit on marking up those those medications. So for the drug prices, they would remain the same. I do the same thing for my labs. Let's say you want to check your cholesterol. The hospital might charge you $125 or that $125 might be billed to your insurance for, let's say, a cholesterol panel. Mm -hmm. That same cholesterol panel in our office is $5. So then you're saving you know, more than 95% on that one test. Sure. Yeah. Um, okay. And that makes the, sense. Hospital, so the hospital is marking it up because that's where they make their money. They make it on the margins. Yeah. And by, by upcharging those labs and imaging services, they make more money. Mm -hmm. And they're covering all of the overhead costs associated with running a separate entity, whereas you're rolling it all into your care you're already providing. So you don't sure. have that additional. So cost. I guess yeah. what I'm saying is if I'm able to cut out all the middlemen, the pharmacy benefit managers, the hospital administrators, um, and all the technicians between my patients and their medical services, I can keep the cost really low. So maybe if I were to scale up tremendously and have, I don't know, 10,000 members, then we'd probably have to hire somebody to manage all of our pharmacy in-house. Let's hypothetically. And then- In that great news that you have now 10,000 customers. Yeah. Right, exactly. And then, or we would just increase the membership rate by five or $10 per member per month so that we could hire somebody to manage all these costs and all of these, coordinate all of these different things like lab contracts and meds and imaging services. You, know, you don't really want to do that, but for right now in our DPC practice, I have a few enough members where I can manage all these services and not inflate the cost of these services. You're really, okay. my members are just really paying for my time. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. So one of the, the comments sense, that came up. But did it answer your question? Um, sort of. So I, I, the reason I ask is because I think in some ways the reason we are where we are today in terms of how inflated and bureaucratic a lot of the hospital systems are is because 
where we started 50 years ago and then, oh, it got a little bigger. It became a little bit more of a group of things and a group of things. And that basically got to the point where we need all of these levels of people to manage it. So sure. it's just where I'm looking at, it'll be just be interesting to watch as DPC grows to say, can we still maintain some of those same efficiencies or in achieving the efficiencies of scale, we also create new levels of bureaucracy with scale. So it'll sure. just, it's really I just to watch and see at this point. I, that's why I really believe in the individual family physician, individual primary care physician, because if these doctors can grow up and have 500 members or two partners and 1500 members, so you have three docs, 1500 members, mm -hmm. and maintain those cost savings and efficiencies. Mm -hmm. And then when you scale, you add on another clinic, but make that lead doctor in charge of managing all of those efficiencies. Then you can keep costs low and maintain those efficiencies and cost savings for patients. And I think if doctors do that, this, this model will remain really attractive to patients. And once those prices inflate, maybe those patients will look for the other doctor with more efficiencies. You know, it is a free market still. So mm -hmm. hopefully that keeps us honest as we grow. And I guess that, that really brings us to a, an important question in this whole model, which is right now you're doing this because it's something you're passionate about. It's something mm -hmm. you believe in as a better model. You see value for both the physician and the patient. As this becomes more widespread, do we run the risk of people going, oh, that looks more attractive than what I'm doing t today from a work balance standpoint or something else like that, but not sharing the same cost efficiency values that you share and mm -hmm. potentially over time, those prices going up and, and um, not necessarily having the same level of, of access to affordable care through this model. Sure. I think that already exists. Let's just okay. say it's concierge medicine, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. $2,000 a year to have mm -hmm. access to a physician and they're still billing their insurance and not looking for price savings for their members. I think what's really exciting and revolutionary about this direct primary care model and movement is that we've seen linear growth, whereas concierge has kind of been flat. You know, there are a certain number of concierge clinics because there's only so many people in the top three, five, 10% of income earners to afford that service. Whereas I think 90% of Americans or virtually any American with an income could afford a direct primary care service. And so I think that's what's exciting. We've kind of figured out the special sauce of the model and made it that information widespread so other doctors can take this up and serve people on their own terms in this model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, so brief question that came up in the LinkedIn conversation was sure. around childhood vaccinations. So yeah, of course. if as a family, I'm saying we're going to move to a DPC model, we're going to have all five of us, I have three children, we're going to have all five of us having, we're not going to go to a primary care physician, we're mm -hmm. not going to go to a pediatrician, we're going to come to you. Now, I actually had to pay out of pocket one time for a vaccination I'm because sorry. I went to a pediatrician that was part of a hospital network and didn't realize they were going to charge it as an in-network, as an out-of-network hospital benefit, not yeah. as a, yeah, it was a big, it was a big debate. Yeah. I won. I didn't end up paying for it. But Good. needless to say, it exposed me to some of the ridiculously high costs that you can sometimes be charged to an insurance as a vaccination. So sure. it just brings up that question of um, a lot of the things you would get through insurance with preventative care, you're going to be providing anyway. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your annual exam, those sorts of things are all obviously going to be part of primary care. But when it comes to things like childhood vaccinations, how do you handle that if people don't have an alternative primary uh, doctor that they're seeing besides the DPC? Yeah. So fortunately for us, um, if you're uninsured, you can go to the health departments. Uh, true, so true. there's like the county health department, Detroit city health department. And I have a lot of families who are uninsured using those options. Okay. And then fortunately, one of the large hospital systems has a vaccine clinic where they're really pushing to get everybody vaccinated and they see folks who are uninsured and insured and they will bill the insurance through that platform. And I think okay. as a market around people, you know, looking for efficiencies starts to grow as the consumers demand more free market options. I think we'll see more options like that where you can just go in and be vaccinated and not have to have a pediatric visit, just go to the vaccine clinic and get it done. And they'll build their insurance and incur those back end costs to get the payoff payout from the insurance company. Um, just to cover some other preventive things, if you were to get the vaccines 
and pay out of pocket. I do have families do that through our office. It's about $2,000 for the childhood vaccine series, zero to 18. Mm -hmm. um, mammograms in our office, we use a third party imaging service. It's $169 for a cash pay mammogram. Colonoscopy, we've, we've negotiated for about $1,000 some have gotten a little bit less, others have gotten a little bit more. That's about standard. Mm -hmm. it's Which more honestly, a lot of people are gonna pay more than that with their out-of-pocket deductible. Exactly. Yeah, it's supposed to be covered through your insurance if it's a screening thing, but once you have bleeding, it's no longer a screening yeah. thing, and then you get billed a really high amount. Of course, there's like $75 per biopsy that they run in addition to that $1,000. Um, let's see what else. Oh, PSA screening. You know, it's $10 to run a PSA digital rectal exam is included in the service. Mm -hmm. Um, what else we got here? Um, oh, CT scan of the lungs. If you're a smoker, 30 pack year history, you know, 150, $200 to get that screening, um, CT scan of the lungs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, so there's there's some room for uh, additional services to kind of supplement the DPC model, but when you look at the overall package of what you're getting versus what you're paying to have a few of these that are out of pocket um, versus the amount you're paying in medical insurance and, and what you're getting for those services. So. Yeah, and I, th I think that really comes down to the consumer making a well-informed decision mm -hmm. on what they value Mm -hmm. um, and what it costs and looking for the best quality. And I think it's really up to us as citizens, as consumers to seek out the best options and, and really find what's right for ourselves and our families. And I think we, as like a grassroots movement of physicians working with patients can right size our healthcare problems. Mm -hmm. And I think once we do that on the primary care end, I think more and more options for catastrophic health insurance will come into play where consumers can look, oh, I'm getting 90% of what I need through Plum Health, through direct primary care. Now I can go out and shop for that coverage for the 10% of times when I might be hospitalized mm -hmm. and make an informed decision on what that coverage looks like. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when it comes to this conversation around 80, 90% of care, um, is, are we talking 80 to 90% of what the average person would need in the average year? Is that kind of... I guess where I'm going with this is there are um, a number of articles and books that have referenced the idea that the first two years and the last two years of a person's life represent mm. about 50% of the total cost of their care. Right. And I haven't done the research to know if that's accurate or not, but I've seen this quoted a few different places. And so Sounds about if right. in fact that is the case, then are, how much of the cost problem are we solving in this move on a macro level. Obviously the individual patient is experiencing a completely different experience with DPC, but is it taking a big enough chunk out of the insurance model in order to reduce overall rates if you were to see widespread adoption of DPC? Yeah, I think what's interesting is that in this model, I actually have time to counsel my patients and when my patients are aging, um, it's a good time to talk to them about end of life care. As I mentioned before, you know, I'm trained in palliative care medicine and end of life care. And so really making sure that people have their um, orders in order for like what they want to be done with themselves at the end of life and really taking an hour with a patient and sitting down and just having them bring in a family member, you know, their next of kin and sitting down with them and discussing what do you want when your heart fails or your lungs fail or you're hospitalized? How long do you want to be intubated if that were the case? Or do you want to be intubated at all? Or if your heart stops, do you want to be resuscitated? These are difficult conversations to have. And I think it doesn't happen in our current primary care system because physicians simply don't have time. But if that's something valuable that I can add to a patient and their family, and that's, then that will help me grow my business and my relationships with my patients. And they'll recommend me to their, their other friends and family members you should talk to Dr. Paul because he actually sat down with us and discussed our end of life options. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's a valuable conversation to have. Yeah. And that's actually, I just last week finished the book, uh, being mortal by Atul Gawande. Oh, and that's a big part of what he talks about, right. Is that whole concept that when there is a physician who is prepared to have those difficult conversations, mm -hmm. it actually does reduce the overall cost in those last few years of life because people are now making decisions ahead of time, not, desperately trying to 
eke every last day out in those last moments. And they're looking at quality of, of life, um, not just number of days. And sure. all those very complex issues that are hard to talk about when everybody's right. healthy. But yeah, there's a lot of emotional triggers that go into death, obviously. And, and, you know, if you can have people talk about it in a rational way ahead of time and, and make their emotions known, their intentions known before it happens, so they're not scrambling to call their son or daughter in, in that last moment to get the okay for, a, let's say, a DNR or something like that, do not resuscitate order. Mm-hmm. It makes things much more smooth in the hospital for everyone involved, the doctors, the nurses, the patient, their family, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, I've got two more questions, and then I'm sure if there's other things that we've uh, brushed by that you want to talk about. But um, on the on the question of malpractice insurance, I mentioned sure. maybe that would be more, and I had a couple of DPC doctors who wrote back and said, "Oh no, it's way less because when you're spending an hour with somebody, you're you're better able to cover the topic." Um, the perspective I was looking at it from is if I say to you. I'm sewing up your hand, right? Then mm-hmm. my limitation of scope is related to sewing up your hand. But if I'm saying I'm providing preventative care or we're doing um, planning for how to avoid certain situations down the line, then as we all know, this is not a magic bullet. This is not going to stop any of your patients from ever contracting any issues. You know, there's, we find medical professionals that still have a tumor they didn't know about or whatever else. So is there a risk of, by telling people that you're providing more comprehensive, more preventative care, that you're actually exposing yourself to a broader range of liability where a patient comes back and says, you told me you were doing all of these preventative measures and I still got cancer or whatever else like that. Is that something that you think is a concern? Ah, man, that's a big one. (laughs) But uh, just, just on the face of it, um, my malpractice insurance is the same as if I were to um, be practicing in a fee-for-service clinic. I know that some doctors have been able to leverage the fact that they have fewer patients to get a discounted rate on their malpractice insurance. Listen, I only have 500 patients versus the typical doctor is 2,500. I'm spending an hour where they're spending 15 minutes. Give me a break here. You know, <laughs> Probability of a problem is lower. You should look at the stats. Yeah, yeah okay. exactly. Yeah. yeah, talk to your actuaries and yeah. <laughs> So, you know, I'm in a little bit more litigious community in, in Southeast Michigan, in Detroit specifically. So my rates are actually higher than the rest of the state of Michigan, just purely based on geography, which mm-hmm. kind of sucks, but it is what it is. So uh, in short, I pay, I think, $450 a month for my malpractice insurance. Um, and I'm happy with that. And I get to know my patients, I know them, and they know my limits. And I'm not promising them the moon. I'm just saying, I'm your primary care physician. I'm doing what a normal primary care physician would. I just have more time to listen to you and understand where you're coming from. I'm going to order the same tests. I'm going to recommend the same things um, preventive-wise. And, you know, I'm not making a guarantee that I'm going to prevent more cancers. I'm just going to have more time to spend with you to talk about it. So, so that's th- the next phase, right? I think it's really in, in how you frame the conversation. I'm, I'm providing primary care medical services just as any other family physician would. I'm just using a different model to accomplish that goal. Okay. okay. Yeah, I think uh, it's a very realistic approach. I just know that some people aren't always so rational when it comes to life and death situations. Right, right. So, and I think... I think someone would be just as upset in a fee for service system and just as likely to pull the trigger on a lawsuit as in a DPC system. But I don't, I, I don't know where to look for data on that. So this is more of a gut reaction. And if somebody watches this and you've got great data, leave it in the comments. And yes, we'd love to hear about it. Yeah. (laughs) Well, and also this is, as you mentioned, you know, it's growing over the last few years. I'm sure that's something that we'll need a larger sample size, more people involved and more of a population to get more information around how that behavior plays out. Sure. And I'm sure that the um, actuaries at these malpractice insurance um, institutions will make those calculations for us and determine our rates based on those relationships and the model that you're using. Yeah. So we'll have to check back in in a few years on that one. 
Yeah, of course. <laughs> so then, uh, so my last question is a little bit more um, from the system operations kind of side of things. So I know that there is a lot of discussion and angst in the community around the EHR, EMR tools that the mm -hmm. average doctor is having to work with um, that in a lot of ways have been developed for the purposes of billing compliance rather than for patient management. Mm -hmm. um, likewise, I know that some of the tools that my dermatologist uses are both to ensure that we have continuity of coverage and are properly tracking my history of skin cancer, but they're also making sure that we have all the different categories for which of these five billing codes should apply. Mm -hmm. And part of what makes me curious in this DPC model, because I work in the global health space, is are there specific tools that you would say, because we don't do billing the way that typical primary care providers do billing, there are different tools that we would use. There are different programs we would use to track patient history and, and continuity of care. There are different tools we would use to manage uh, the devices that we have, those sorts of things. There's a lot of bloat in the system related to insurance. So are there secondary benefits to not only not having to deal with insurance itself, but creating systems that are designed with ex insurance needs excluded? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I think from a consumer side, it's a question that doesn't get asked often enough. It's like of the, let's say your, your doctor has 2,400 patients. They see 1% of their panel a day, which is realistic. So about 24 visits a day. Mm -hmm. That comes out to um, uh, a new visit every 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And if you talk to the typical patient, they would say, I only get to see my patient, my doctor for five to 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. That's because they're spending the other 10 to 15 minutes documenting the relationship, the encounter in a computer that's purely meant for billing, right? These are, these are tools that are built to bill the insurance company, not take care of the patient. And, and even often the five to 10 minutes, they're in the room, they're looking at the screen, not at the patient. Yeah. And, and clicking the check boxes so that they get paid, right? Mm -hmm. That's a reality. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, this is what I believe is that, the doctors in the fee-for-service system, their customer is the insurance company. So they build things to, to take care of that customer and the patient is secondary. In the direct primary care movement, the direct primary care model, our customer is our patient. So we're building our systems to really take care of our patient in the best way possible. And, and there are some different electronic medical records specifically built for direct primary care practices. Personally, I use the Atlas EMR system okay. and there are no check boxes. It's purely a, a documentation tool where I write a narrative about my patient. And there are some tools that I can use within that, like reminder systems. I even use Google Calendar because I have the time to remind myself to follow up with, let's say, Laura. Uh, Laura is trying to quit smoking. So every month I have a reminder in my Google Calendar that says, text Laura and see how many cigarettes she's smoking. And that is a nice tool for, my, for me. And then it's a great result for my patient because they know that their doctor is actually thinking about them, looking out for them, texting them every month mm -hmm. and keep it, holding them accountable for their smoking cessation or their step count or their dietary habits. Or, hey, text me a photo of your blood sugar readings of the last week. How are you doing with your fasting blood sugar? And, oh, doc, I'm doing great, or uh, I really need to pay more attention. And it's a nice reminder tool. So I think as this movement grows, I think the um, electronic health records, electronic medical record systems will really optimize patient care versus insurance billing. And we're starting to see that with platforms like Atlas or Hint, um, Elation, et cetera, where it's more consumer-focused, patient-focused versus insurance-focused. Okay. That's, that's good to hear there's people working on that because I see that as the huge piece of not only the experience with the patient, but the experience for the doctor if they're not having to spend all their time, even if you don't need all those boxes, still having to skip through all those pages. So that's good. Right. To you know, to quote a friend in the movement, Dr. Umber, Josh Umber with Atlas, he says, you know, we really don't have a manpower problem for healthcare in America for our primary care. We have an efficiency problem. If you took away all those minutes that we were spending clicking boxes in the insurance-based system for payment and put all those towards taking care of our patients, 
we'd really be able to take care of everybody in the United States effectively, efficiently, but we're not because we're using this bad, you know, fee for service model. Mm -hmm. Okay. I really appreciate, we've talked through all of the, the questions that I had brought up. Was there kind of anything else you wanted to talk through from your side of things? I think we can leave it at this. I'm, I'm really happy answering your questions. And um, if you're watching and wondering what's the book, it, it, I should plug myself. It is Go for it. Primary Care, The Cure for a Broken Healthcare System. It's on Amazon. The ebook's $4. The paperback's 10 bucks. I really wrote it to communicate clearly uh, why our current primary care system is broken, what direct primary care is, and, and I use some concrete examples in our third and final chapter around how we're helping serve people in, in our um, Southwest Detroit community. And that's one thing I will mention, just to riff off of that, I think the, one of the biggest problems with our current fee-for-service system is it, it incentivizes doctors and hospital systems to locate their practices in the wealthiest or highest income communities because that's where people have the best insurance um, uh, reimbursement rates, right? Mm -hmm. If you have a, let's say, blue something, blue something plan, they're going to reimburse higher if it's a private plan versus, uh, let's say, a Medicaid plan. They're going to get fewer dollars. So what we've seen in Detroit is in the city of Detroit, there's fewer than 100 primary care physicians for 630,000 residents. And if you go over eight mile, you know, cross eight mile into Oakland County, a wealthier suburban community to the north, you have one primary care physician for every 612, 680 residents. So there's a 10 X disparity. Difference. And yeah. so one of the goals of my practice is opening a clinic in a health provider shortage area or health professional shortage area in Southwest Detroit and really meet the demands of the community in a way that's sensitive to the uh, to the incomes of my community, right? Our median income is somewhere around $26,000 where I serve, yet we have a full thriving primary care service because it's valuable for the patients in my community. Which actually is uh, pretty impressive when you think about the fact that these are people who are choosing to pay out of pocket for this service because they have that much better of an experience. This is not people who have a bunch of extra money and they feel like they'd rather have a doctor on call. This is people right. who are who are recognizing the value and are willing to pay for it speaks yeah. volumes to what it is. Yeah. And to be fair, we do have folks from every spectrum of the income, uh, every part of the income spectrum. We do have a, you know, a, a group of folks who are, you know, wealthy, high income earners who choose to engage in our service because we give them something really valuable and that is their time. So if yeah. you text me and you need an appointment and I say, I'll see you at 11, I'll actually see you at 11. And if it takes 20 minutes, you'll be gone at 1120. You know, that's You're it. You're not going to sit in the waiting room for 45 minutes, then be seen by two different nurses. And an hour later, maybe the doctor comes. In. Yeah, exactly. Or not even see your doctor and be, you know, passed off to their physician extender, like a PA or an NP and kind of feel like, well, why do I even, you know, some people have that bad experience where they're like, I didn't even get to see my doctor. Right. So it's valuable for different segments of the population for different reasons. Some people are members because I save them the entire cost of their membership just on medications alone, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty easy decision for those to the math. <laughs> Not right. really the much more than that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, okay. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for chatting yeah. with me. And Absolutely. hopefully this will save appropriately and I can get it uploaded onto YouTube. Also cross your fingers for me. <laughs> okay. We'll talk again soon. All right. Thanks again. Bye. Bye.